we all have been hurt in our life by someone else. Whether it be someone who backbited against us, or whether it be someone who broke our trust, or someone that harmed us in some way, we all have been hurt in our lives. And oftentimes we hold these grudges, and people hold grudges to the point where people don't go to certain events because the other person will be there, certain family gatherings because the other person will be there. Uh, this person they would pass by in the masjid and never say salam. Uh, you know they would never. You know someone dies in 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 in, in that family members uh, and 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 you would not go to janazah even. Um, and and we have this relationship uh, struggles or it would be in work where certain coworkers we don't, we don't like we or someone has done something to us and we avoid them altogether and oftentimes we're skipping out on things or we are, we are and, and it creates this life where you're constricted and you're, you're needing to avoid certain people and, and then anyone that likes them or is cool with them then you, you also blacklist them too and, you, and you're living life by having these blacklists in your mind some of us have longer lists some of us maybe it's just one person but today I want to tell you how do you go about in being able to forgive now, when I, as soon as I said that, you're like, no way, I'm not going to forgive. I have no need to forgive. That person doesn't bother me, I don't bother them. No need to even, even discuss this. Well, let me tell you that you might want to change your mind. When I say forgive, I don't mean you're going to legitimize the person. So you are going to say, you know, what they did was wrong. Forgiving someone doesn't mean you legitimize them or you excuse them. It just means you allow yourself to give that gift of forgiveness because you have that humility and because you're giving that mercy. Number two, you're not forgiving because um, you, you know you have no other options or you're weak. Uh, you couldn't take revenge so only option you have is to be the weak guy and forgive. What I'm telling you because you're, you're strong you're gonna forgive. You're not going to forgive, meaning that you're going to forgive and you're going to call them up and send them a text message or you know, unblock them from Facebook and then tell them, I forgive you. Sometimes forgiving means you forgive them. It has nothing to do with you letting them know. Forgiving someone doesn't mean you're going to forget about what happened. You might still remember it in your life. You might still feel it. You might at times, you still feel, feel hurt about it. And that's okay. But that has nothing to do with forgiveness. So what is this new type of forgiveness that I'm talking about? When I mean forgiveness, I mean five steps. So I want you to know these five words. And inshallah, we're going to make five videos out of each of these words in the weeks to come. So the first word is honesty. Number two, second word is humility. Number three is mercy. Number four is generosity. And number five is trust. Five words. So I want to introduce you to these five words and what it means. What these five words mean is that it begins by honesty. So honesty means your first step in you being able to do this new type of forgiveness that I'm talking about. Is number one, being honest means you are honest with yourself and acknowledging that it, it actually did hurt. And what they did was wrong. And you leave it at that. You're honest about that experience. Sometimes you say, no, no, I moved on. I don't care, that was a long time ago. But you know what? It still affects you in some way. And so being really brutally honest, saying, you know what? It did hurt. You know what? I didn't agree with that. So honesty. Number two is humility. Humility means once you're honest, it also means looking at yourself and seeing, you know what? There were times in my life that I hurt someone else. There are times in my life when I needed someone else's forgiveness. And then of course, biggest is that I would want Allah to forgive me on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Right? So that's um, humility. Number three is mercy. So if you're going to go to the next step where you're going to actually forgive, it's be, it has to be from the place of you have mercy for him, human beings. You, you, have, you have compassion for human beings. And then number four, then you give that generosity. I look at forgiveness as actually a generosity. It's not that they deserve it. Or that it's not that you don't have any other options. You're, you're giving forgiveness because you're generous. And then number five is obviously trust. Meaning you trust that, you know, these five steps. You trust that you can rebuild the relationship if you wanted to. Sometimes you may not rebuild the relationship. 
afterwards. Sometime, you know, sometime you will. But trust that person, trust the event, and trust Allah that Allah, you know, will compensate you. And that you yourself will be in a better position. Because oftentimes these grudges and these anger that you hold affects you. So inshallah, we're going to go, go into it specifically for each of these five steps and what it means. And in a detail on how to actually do it. So I want to leave you with an amazing story I, you know, that I have come across on forgiveness. And it's about a, a individual by the name of Sammy Rango. Sammy was born in Texas. Um, at three years old, he moved to um, Chicago, Illinois. And by the age three, his mother had abandoned him in some sense to his uncle. And his uncle was extremely abusive who he was living with and not only abusive he was molesting uh, uh, him and and, and his uh, younger sister and to the point that one day he said you know I was walking past his room and he called me inside I, I could see that he you know he you know he point his finger he told me to come inside when I went inside I knew something was wrong he said because I saw my uncle you know he, he was naked on, on, on the bed and next to him was my younger sister, who was only a few years older than me. And he, you know, motioned me to come, come to the bed. And I just, I, as a three-year-old, I felt something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I knew something was wrong. And my sister started crying and trying to defend me from being pulled into the bed. And he threatened both of us. If you say any word, I will kill both of you. And he proceeded to rape, you know, and molest both him and his uh, sister. And he said, I grew up with these scars. And he said, you know, uh, my mother was also very abusive. Uh, um, 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 to the point that some of her punishments were so horrific. I mean, you know, she, she used to punish, punish me when, when I would do something to the point where she would not give me food. Or not even allow me to you know, go to the bathroom. So my punishment would be that I would have to wear, uh, you know, wear underwear and just be so that I, I cannot pick up food or hide any food. And if I need to use the restroom, I was not, I wasn't allowed to the point that if I, I, I and I would be forced, is it basically humiliation? I would be forced to pee on myself or you know, or to defecate on myself. And then if I did that, she would take take the underwear and stuff it on my face. And if I puked or vomited, she, she I would get more beating. I would have punishment, he said, I would have punishments where I would need to kneel on, 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 on the floor, you know, and, and next to her bed. He said, by age eight, I had already tried to commit suicide. And, you know, in, in, in he, as he's living in this, in this torture and this punishment and, as, as a child and growing up in, in this neglected and abused household, he said, you know, I remember at age 11, I had a turning point. It was a few days after my birthday, I was standing with a knife. Uh, you know, on on the bed of my mother, of my mother. At night time, I'm standing with the bed and I'm standing with a knife. At that moment, I, I was deciding if I'm going to murder her. And he said I couldn't get myself to murder her, and so I left my house. And so at age 11, he, you know, uh, got away from his house and he left left the house. He ran away. And he said, you know, next few years of my life was turbulent and I end up joining street violence and gangs you know he said by age 11 you know I him and his girlfriend buried their first son by age 11 and and you know he was his his, his girlfriend at that time was pregnant two two young young you know uh, men and women and 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 two young boys and girls uh, actually and he said I remember going to the hospital and my my girlfriend at that time also his age 11 12 and she delivered the baby and the doctor brought the baby in into like this this you know tissue blue tissue paper and and put it in the front and he walked out and he left and he said as I looked at the tray covered with the blue tissue and green tissue paper I knew that I, I knew what was inside and so when I opened, opened, the, op opened it, I saw a figure of a baby, the head looked like a balloon, and you know, I, I saw that it, it, baby's colors are all different, it, it, uh, colors that you should never see on a baby. He said, at that point, I, 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 had, I had lost it. There was no one there for me to help me cope with this grief, to cope with this loss. And he said, then I really turned violent. He said, before this, you know, uh, before this, I, I was involved in some violence, and one man, when he was killing someone, he, he gave me, you know, weapon to finish it off, finish the job off. 
and I couldn't get myself to kill. But after that incident, when I lost my first son and no one was there to cope with me and help me process life, he said, at that point, I, I became a really cold killer. And, and me and my friends, we picked on a homeless person and hurt him. And, and I, want, I really wanted to kill him. The man did nothing to me, but I wanted to kill him. By age 17, he ended up in a jail. And, and by that time, he was already committing all sorts of crime. He was involved in, uh, in the second most notorious Latino uh, gang um, in Chicago. And, you know, he says, I, I, I got into a jail. And this, this, this jail, there was this race riot. You know, there was all this, uh, there was this division. You have the whites. And then you have the blacks. And obviously, if you say me being Latino, I chose the side of the minority, the black. And so we had this fight. So there was 30, you know, white guys with knives and all sorts of chair, weapon, whatever. And here we were, we also have weapon, and we were going to go at it. This is, this is happening inside the jail. And they, they, each, there was groups, and they had, they had beef with each other. And he said, when the fight started, you know, we were going at it. And people are just trying to kill each other, and this is, this, this, this fight is happening inside the jail. He's, he said the prison guard walked in, and he shot, and he, you know, he rang a fire, and everybody dispersed, you know. And he said, well, unfortunately, I was next to the wall, and then on my only escape was to go through the the where the white, you know, the thirty guys were, were still standing. So I had no way out. And so as soon as the guard left, now the all thirty approached me. So now I was all by myself without my other 10 guys. And so one of my friend, you know, one of my friend, you know, he, he, he joined trying to defend me. And as soon as the, we started going at it again and the guard came back in and he shot a fire and he hit my, you know, uh, friend and there was a hole in, 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 in his stomach. And I, as I see him ly laying there, he had no weapon, he just came to defend me. But because he was black, he was shot first, even though I had the weapons. Regardless, after that, you know, he was bleeding, and the whole jail, uh, you know, was in lockdown. They said no one in, no one out. This is what you get for right. This is what you get for prison fight. And uh, we were trying to complain to the guard. Look, he's dying. He got shot in this whole whole. Deal. He said no one in, no one out. I don't care, you know. And they shut the whole j jail down uh, because of the riot. And and you know, he said, you know, I couldn't see my f friend die, so I, I, I started, you know, hadgering, and, and then, you know, eventually they, they broke through the front security and they got into the, you know, hospital prison. But, but by that time, he, he already died. And because of his role in this prison fight, he ended up, you know, getting higher rank in, 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 in his, um, you know, uh, uh, gang. And he, when he came out, he became a leader of the gang. And he said, by that point, I was hurting people. I didn't care. I was a cold-blooded killer. I was doing things, you know, and, 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 and I just didn't, it just didn't matter. He's, you know, he spent seven years, you know, he got in jail again a few years later. He spent seven years in jail. And he said, you know, when, 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 that, when that whole riot, riot happened when he was age 17, you know, they put him in 22 months in the hole. Meaning, you know, in, in, in solitary con confinement. And he came out actually more influential. In his, and so he said, after that, when I went to jail, I used to go, walk into any jail and I would take it over. Because I had the power. And I would take it over. I would get guards beat up. I would get inmates beat up. And I, I, and I, I was that. And he said, to the point that guards, you know, the prisons will, will, will keep on shifting me. Because some of them don't feel safe having me. He said, I went to, they took me to another one prison. And the front guards were having discussion. And I, I overheard them saying, you know, we can't accept this man here. We're not equipped to have him in this jail. We're not equipped to have him in this prison. He said, that day, I really felt it. He said, you know, if a man is not accepted by society, because he's so violent, he's so hurtful, he's, he's such a you know, monster, he goes to a jail. But even the jail doesn't want to accept me. Where is my place in the world? And so he said, you know, that made me even more brutal. He said, until one day, this, this somebody came to visit my prison cell. And he said, you know, I, I want to hear your story. You know, wh 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 why are you here? And they offered him to, to take part in a rehab program in the jail. And he said, you know what, I figured, let me get through this rehab program. I you know, have to go through this group, group therapy sessions and whatnot. I don't care, I'll just play the game. I, I'll say I can get out early from, 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 from um, uh, you know, being in jail. And so he said, I sat in that group, group therapy session and, and the counselor and whatnot. He turned to me and he said, um, you know, um, uh, he, want, he, he asked me, uh, so tell me about your mother. And he said, I was taken aback by that question. He said, my mother? I haven't, I haven't even thought about her or talked about her since age 11. He said, well, I don't want to talk about my mother. 
He said, he, and he pressured me and pushed me. Now I wanted to be part of the program, so I played along and I started talking about her. He said, the first word that I said came out of my mouth, it came with tears. I have never talked to her in 11, in, in, since age 11. And he said, I started talking, and he said, then the counselor did something interesting. He turned to me, he grabbed a chair in front of me, and he said, he said, he said Sammy, what if your mom was sitting in that chair? What would you ask her? And he said, I, I, don't, I didn't know what I was going to say. Then one thing came out of my mouth was, how can you do this to me? How could you have done this to me? How could you have done this to us? Me and my siblings. And then he said, the, the, the counselor pushed me in further. He said, now you go sit in that chair. I want you to be your mom. Imagine that you're her. Turn, turn to you, Sammy, and tell me what was she, how she respond. And so he said, I sent that chair, you know, thinking, okay, my mom, what would I say? And all that could come out of my mouth was, I'm sorry. And so then he had me come back to my chair and, and asked me, how, how are you feeling right now? I told him how much my hate, my anger, my, my, my grudge, and, and how, how much I hate her, how much I, you know, all that she has done to me, how, the way she has hurt me. And after that, he said, the counselor said to me something that changed my life. He said, Sammy, he turned to me and said, Sammy, have you ever hurt anyone? like the way your mom has hurt you. Sammy, have you ever hurt anyone like the way your mom has hurt you? And he said, that was a turning point in my life. He said, for the next several years, it was, it was a long list of apologies. All the people that are hurt, all the people that I, that, that are, that are, that I you know, just brutally attacked. And he's now, you know, he has a master's in social work right now, and he's, he's actually a, a counselor um, um, working with people coming out of jail. But what that tells you is the power of forgiveness. That oftentimes you have grudges and you have anger against people in your life, and you don't realize those venom are inside you, and that those venom affects you. Those venom uh, impact you. And it shapes you as a person. If you're not able to let it go by these five steps that we're going to cover, inshallah, in the, in the upcoming videos, if you don't allow that, those venoms are still inside you. So it's not about you holding a grudge and you don't talk, not talking to this cousin or not talking to this coworker or this person in the masjid. It's not about that. It's about really you letting go of that venom that's inside you and that's affecting you. So inshallah, we're going to cover that five steps. And it's about how do you forgive and, and how do you let go of that grudge and how do you give that gift of forgiveness as a leader to yourself, as a leader in your family, as a leader in your organizations.